Romans chapter 13. Our title is Living in This World. Remember last Sunday? It was Living in This World Government. Scripture reading this morning. All about government. Don't, don't, don't you just love government? If you've, if you've watched the news the last couple of weeks... And, and back and forth with the debt ceiling. And just a few weeks ago in Minnesota for the, the get a budget and back and forth. And a few months ago with our, with our budget. And, and it's just like, sometimes it's just plain crazy. Well, I wanted to, I should have emphasized this more last Sunday and I thought about it afterwards. What does verse 1 through 7 tell you? God sets up those that are in authority. God appoints, whether you like them or not. God sets up believing leaders and He sets up unbelieving leaders. Do you realize that God put Saddam Hussein in office? Do you realize that? It's what the Bible teaches. There is no authority but by God. And they are ministers of God. And because they are full-time in their service, then we need to pay taxes in order to support them. Boy, that grates against some of the things that we think about. But it's, it's what the Bible says. But I wanted you to see this. God is sovereign even in the political government affairs of life. There's no surprises. God is sitting up in the heavens right now and saying, Come on, guys. I already know what you're going to do. I already know what's going to happen. And I almost wonder if he just doesn't reach down once in a while and give one a, a swift kick in the pants just to get them moving. Makes me wonder at times. But anyway, government. That's last week. This week, it's others. Other people. How do you get along with other people? Well, anyway, let's look at a few verses. You have your Bibles open to, to Romans chapter 13. Follow along as I read in verse 8. This is right after what I just read a few moments ago. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Before we go further, let's pray together. Father, now we ask, us, you, ask you to guide and direct us as we look and study this portion of Scripture this morning. May we trust you. We're not trusting our government. We're trusting you to be in charge of our government. May we trust you as we love others. May we trust you as we do right in this world. Teach us and guide us from this passage, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we study, for those of you visiting with us, we've been in this study of the book of Romans for over a year now. And the reason we're doing it as a whole book is because that's the way you have to do it to understand it. And there are several parts of the book of Romans. The theme of the book of Romans is the gospel of God. That's the overall theme. The gospel, the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That which changes our lives. In, ver in chapters 1 through 3, we see the need for the gospel. We see the need for the gospel. He says, why do you need this? And so he says, we're sinners. We're, we're, we're lost. And we need Jesus Christ. We need salvation. We need our sins forgiven. Second thing in chapters 4, 5, and 6 is the gospel is by faith. Salvation is by faith and faith alone. It's by what you believe. Not just in your head, not just head knowledge, but what do you believe in your heart and soul? What do you trust with your very life? Chapter 7 and 8 is how it works. Some of you may not be as interested in that. You may not care how your car works as long as it gets you from A to B. You're concerned that it works, but not how it works. Some of you, like me, we like to understand how it does this and how it does that. And so sometimes it's easy. I can take it apart. If I can figure out how it works, I appreciate it a lot more. How does the gospel work? That's chapter 7 and 8. 
Israel and the Gospels, chapter 9, 10, 11, with everything going on in the Middle East. That's very, very practical for today. And then with chapter 13 through 16, or chapters 12 through 16, how does it affect us now? How does it apply in our daily lives? Now this one here today is going to be very, very, very practical. I told you several weeks ago, chapters 12 through 16 are just extremely practical in what they teach. And we're going to see that for sure today. Now, here's a question for you. Do you really love other people? I'm not, now, I'm not talking, do you love a mother or father or son or daughter or boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife do just other people in general those that you're not related to or don't have any special akin relationship to do you love them do you love the people that you work with do you love the people that you live next door to do you live the people that you live in the same house with? Do you love those people that you just met and you don't even know they're sitting maybe in the next booth at the restaurant or in the same aisle at the store? Do you love people? How do you know? We'll answer that. Secondly, I want you to understand this. Love is giving. It is not demanding. It is not demand. If somebody says to you, if you love me, you will do this and this. That is not love. That is not love. Sometimes we have the, well, you're this. You have to serve us. You have to do this. If you love me, you're going to do this. That's not love. Love, according to the Bible, is, is willingly putting yourself in service or giving to another. It's because you want to, not because you have to. Get a couple of uh, teenagers or adolescents together and say, do you love your brother? Do you love your sister? Well, yeah. That's really convincing. Wait till they're teenagers and they got a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Do you, oh, yeah, I love it. It's a whole different attitude. What about that neighbor? What about that work person? What about that person in the store that's taking all that time in, this, in the checkout line? You love that person? Let's look at some things here. Number one is the debt of love. The debt of love. Verse 8 says this, Oh, no man, anything. Now let me stop there. This is not a commentary on money here. Okay? Some people take that verse out and say, listen, see here, the Bible says you should never have a debt. And there are some people that, and, and many great preachers and theologians that would never have a debt for anything, a debt for even a home or a car. And they would say, well, see right there it says, Romans 13, 8, owe no man anything. The context is not finances here. It's using it as an illustration of a greater application. Owe no man anything. Literally what it means is don't owe anybody that you can't pay back. In other words, don't have a debt that you can't pay. Or don't be delinquent in your debt. Don't, don't, pay, don't have a debt that you're not planning to pay. That's called fraud. He says, owe no man anything but to love one another. To love one another. He that loves one another has fulfilled the law. What does he say? He says, don't owe anybody, but there's one debt. There's one debt that you ought to have. You ought to owe love to other people. You ought to owe love to other people. Love, again, is self-sacrifice. It's willing. It's because you want to. I can't come around this morning and say, hey, listen, you're going to love this person whether you like it or not. It doesn't work. You, you can't force somebody. You can't force them. It, it, it just it doesn't happen because I'm going to tell you, you won't be loving. You won't treat them the way you ought to. He says, don't owe any man anything, but owe him love. Say, hey, listen, I owe to love you. I owe that to you. And he says, what happens? 
That fulfills the law. There is a debt of love according to the Lord. God, ladies and gentlemen, wants us to get along. Now the fun part is, it doesn't always happen. There are some times that people are disagreeable. There are times that people are difficult to get along with. There are some times that we will love them godly and in every way the way we should and we still can't get along with them. That happens sometimes. Again, as, as we looked at it a couple weeks ago, it's not what that we have a perfect situation, but as much as, as is our responsibility. Back in chapter 12 it says, as much as lies within you is, or you are able to, live at peace with all men. Or in other words, as much as it's your part, as much as it's your responsibility, you may love somebody, you may love somebody, but they may not love you. One of my sons, several years ago, had a friend. She was in love with him. I think if he had turned to her and said, will you marry me in the next ten seconds, she would have said, yes, I do, and that would have been it. And uh, actually, at one point, several, thought pe several people thought that they were engaged. And, and so... Um, they, they weren't boyfriend, girlfriend, they weren't engaged, but he says, I don't love her. Now, he was a friend, he, he was loving as a friend, but as far as he did not reciprocate that romantic, that marrying love that she had for him. Let me tell you something. If only one person's in love, you've got to struggle. And usually that's what they call divorce. <laughs> okay? But if you get married, then it's not that you just, yeah, I don't want to. What does he say here? Oh, no man, anything but love. I'm not saying you're going to marry that person. I'm not saying you're going to spend your life with them. I'm not saying you're going to agree with them. But treat them in a loving manner. You're going to give of yourself sacrificially that which they don't deserve. Oh, isn't that the love God has for you and me? Let me put it this way, friends. What, was, what would it be like if, we, if God waited for us to be deserving of His love? I'm going to tell you where we'd all be. We'd be in hell right now. We would be there right now because we wouldn't make it through another minute of this life. But God loved us while we were His enemies. God loved us while we were yet in our sins. There was nothing lovely, there was nothing godly about us, but God loved us. He says, now I want you to show this love toward others. And so the debt of love, according to the Lord, is you owe it to love others. Secondly is the responsibility of love according to the law. Go with me to verse, to verse 9. Verse 9 is a long verse, and what does he do? He quotes half of the Ten Commandments. He quotes, he quotes half of them. He says, he says, For the commandments say, You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. The Ten Commandments back in Exodus chapter 20 is kind of split up in two groups. There's one group of laws that are laws toward God. Thou shalt love the Lord your God. You shall not have any other gods before me. You shall not have any other graven images. You will keep the Sabbath day. And, and on and on. He has five laws there. Talks about the relationship with God. But then he has five laws that talk about the relationship with other people. What are those? Well, let's look at the list. The first one he says is thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. What happens when someone commits adultery? It takes away fidelity from the relationship. It takes away trust. It takes away purity. It takes away that which is given. What are, what are the marriage vows? Do you promise to love, honor, cherish, and to keep yourself unto them and only unto them for what? Forsaking all others? 
As long as you both shall live. Sound familiar? Well, that's their traditional vows. But it was to say, you're going to keep yourself just to that person, only to that person, until death do you part. Don't get any ideas on that one. One wife said, so if I kill him, we're, I can remarry? <laughs> Don't go there. He says, if you commit adultery, what do you do? You break that vow that you had. You break, you take the fidelity. You take the, com the, the commitment you, you have from the relationship. And it never comes fully back. It never comes fully back. He says, if you love them, you will not commit adultery. That's a sin against man as much as it is against God. Secondly, thou shalt not kill. Now there's a pretty simple one. Or literal, a literal translation is you shall not murder. You shall not murder. You shall not take an innocent life. Why? Because the life isn't yours. I don't have the right to kill you and you don't have the right to kill me although you may feel like it or I may feel like it at some time. You ever feel like killing somebody? You know, I'm going to say, boy, if I could just get my hands around their neck. Hey, you're not alone. We've all felt that way. You're like, man, if they were at the edge, if they were at the edge of the bridge, I could push them off. Did you read yesterday's paper, this morning's paper, Man Up in the Cities? Fell 55 feet off a bridge. He jumped over a railing. He thought there was a landing on the other side. And he landed, on this, and landed in this park. And he's lived. He's lived. He's going to do all right, I guess. Can you ima I can't imagine jumping a railing on a bridge and realize there's nothing there and all of a sudden... 55 feet. Wow. I thought that was amazing. I usually kill you or me. Thou shalt not kill. You don't have the right to take their life. Now, does this outlaw capital punishment? No. The government has a right to take life. The government has a right to imprison someone. The government has a right to be to find somebody. The first seven verses. If you are an evildoer, be afraid of the powers that be. If you don't want to be afraid, don't do anything wrong. Simple as that. Thou shalt not kill because it takes away a life. Number three, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal because it takes away possessions. That which belongs to another stays with another. You know, there's a, there's a nice thing about having certain vehicles. I, I remember one time reading, reading the list of those vehicles that were most often stolen. Now, you've got to understand, when you're raising eight kids, you don't have one of those vehicles. Ten years ago, if you had known me ten years ago, when, when all of our kids were home and our first one was just starting to leave, for about ten years... We had a, no, not quite 10 years. For a number of years, we had a 1995 Chevy Bouville van, 12-passenger van. Now, it's not bad enough that this is the vehicle that we had for all the kids because it's like, you know, pe people come up and say, you're going to get a bus next? We knew people did have a bus, so. But it had a diesel engine in it. So not only was it big and was it bulky and you, you, know, you open a door and the kids just keep coming out, but it was you know, a diesel engine. I looked several times. That was not in the top 2,000 vehicles to steal. <laughs> it just wasn't there. Now, if I had had a, if I had had a brand new Corvette or something like that, that probably would have been up there. Or a Camaro or a Firebird. Notice the, my branding here. All right. Thou shalt not steal. Why? Because it doesn't belong to you. It is not wrong for one person to have many more possessions than another as long as they've earned it properly. There is not a, everybody should have the same. Some are going to have more because some have earned more. That's biblical. Solomon had a lot more. Abraham had a lot more. David had a lot more. Jacob had a lot more. Look at some of these godly men that had a lot more than other people. 
You shall not steal because that takes away possessions from your neighbor. You cannot steal from your neighbor and love your neighbor. You cannot kill your neighbor and love your neighbor. You cannot commit adultery and love your neighbor. It's impossible. Number four, he says, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Or you take away honor. You take away the truth. You, you take away that which is... You take away that which is something that you can't buy with money. If you lie about someone, if you tell tales about someone, you are not loving them. No way. No fashion. You tell the truth and you give them their honor, you give them the truth, and you don't take that away because when you lie about them, when you bear false witness, when you do the slightest thing in that area, you are taking away honor and truth from that person. Fifth one is thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet. You say, how, is, how does coveting hurt another person? Well, I'm putting it this way. There's nothing... Uh, there's nothing inspired about this, this is mine, is you're taking away value. You're taking away value. It says, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's animals or your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's belongings or your neighbor's Maserati or his, you know, his mansion or whatever. Don't covet it because you take away value. What you're saying is, you don't deserve to have it, I deserve to have it as much as you do. Let me share a little secret with you. If you're making $30,000 a year, you're not going to be able to afford a $300,000 home. You're not going to be able to afford a $50,000 car. It doesn't work that way. Not unless you've got a big inheritance. All right? So in other words, you don't deserve it. It's not. You say, but I deserve No, you don't. Why, why do we deserve anything? We don't deserve anything. But if we earn a certain income, if we have a certain amount of money, then we have the right to have those things, and we have it because of our earning or our honesty or what we have accumulated. But if someone else is coveting and saying, well, listen, I, I don't work as hard, or I don't have the job you have, or I don't have the income or whatever, but I deserve to have yours, you're taking away value from that other person. Because the person that earns a million dollars a year, God bless them. They know how to earn a million dollars a year. And don't take that away from them. Or if there's anything else it says in this verse. It says, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not covet. And if there's any other commandment, they are all summed up this way. And this is, Jesus talks about this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Don't you love having neighbors? Neighbors are fun, aren't they? Did you ever find two neighbors that like exactly the same things and live exactly the same way and cut their yard on the same day and shovel snow in the same manner? I remember seeing a video years ago where one guy had a snowblower and he was running it down his driveway. This is just to cool you off this morning. And he's, he's going down, and, and so he blows all his snow into the neighbor's driveway. And then the other guy gets his snowblower out and he blows it all back in the first driveway. Then the other guy comes with a bigger snowblower and he blows it, you know. It's like, this is endless. What's a loving neighbor do? What should you or I do? We should take it and blow it so it doesn't go in his driveway. Even if he's blown it back in the R's twice. Or he was the first one. We sacrifice agape love. We sacrifice. We give to that other person. I was driving through town yesterday and I was out taking a walk and I saw several lawns that weren't cut. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if one of the neighbors, I saw one with grass about this high, wouldn't it be nice if one of the neighbors just went and cut that lawn without expecting anything in return? You say, well, they should, they should have somebody. Oh, they, they're an old person, but they should have a son or a daughter do it. Yeah, they should. They should take care of their own property. Yes, they should. I'm not saying they shouldn't. But what do we do? 
whether you're right or you're wrong, we will love you. We will help you anyway. That's love. The responsibility of love, according to law, is not to take away, but to give. Last one is the result of love, according to life. Verse 10. Verse 10 says this, Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Now, I want you to take that phrase, and you can take it in slightly two different ways. Okay? And let me ask you which way you thought of it first. Love does no harm to a neighbor. First way of thinking it is, if I love somebody, if I love my neighbor, if I love my person at work, if I love that person in the store, even if I don't know them, if I love that person in school, some of you are going back to school soon. It's only like a month away. Yeah. There are some kids that are starting school tomorrow in town. They're on a new, new schedule. If you truly love them, what? You will not do them any harm. You will not do anything out of spite. You will not do anything out of anger. You will not do anything maliciously. But also let me throw this out. Let me take it in slightly a different way. And this is the way I take it. But it goes both ways. If I love them, it will not harm them. See the difference? The one says, if I love them, I will do them no harm. The second way says, if I love them, it won't hurt them. Did anybody ever love you and it hurt you? Mom, Dad, you know, you took care of me, you fed me, you burped me, you dressed me, you diapered me, you gave me baths, you took care of me, you, you, you got me clothes when I needed it, you took me to school, you got me educated, you, you got me through the teenage years. You know, that really, that really wrecked my life. No. If someone does it right. Now, on the other hand, you don't chain the kid to the bed and withhold food from them. <laughs> Isn't that something what we've seen lately? I can't imagine. I can't, I can't imagine chaining one of my kids to the bed every single night. And you think, would that ever go off? Yeah, it went on right up the road here. Boy, should they have parental rights or shouldn't they? <laughs> That's a hard one, because they're still their kids. I don't think they really realize what they did. Okay? No, if you love them, you will not do them any harm. And if you do them no harm, if you really love them, it's not going to hurt them. It may hurt their backside for a little bit, for a few seconds. But in the long run, it will not be harm. It will be good. Not to love them, that does harm. That does harm. But what does he say? Verse 10. He says this. Love works no ill to his neighbor. Love does not hurt, does not bring any harm to a neighbor. And you can take it two ways. For love is what? The fulfillment of the law. Love is obedience to to the law that was made by God. Why did God give the law in the book of Exodus to the children of Israel? So they could learn how to live with themselves, how to live with God, and how to live with each other. That's the purpose of the law. Some practical things. Hey, Sabbath day, set one day aside for worship. Don't steal. Don't covet. Don't bear false witness. Don't do all these things. That will help you. That will show love to one another. And it what? It will fulfill, it will complete the object, the purpose of the law. Do you realize that God's law is only for our good? God does not give us laws. God does not give us God commandments to restrict us. He gives us laws 
to help us. It's much better to maybe have some punishment and to have your hand kept off the stove than to try and recover from the third degree burns and have scars the rest of your life. You deal with different people differently. You deal with babies different than you do with toddlers. And toddlers different than adolescents. And adolescents different than teenagers. And teenagers different than adults. Most of the time, as long as the adults don't act like teenagers. But you love people in different ways. You love your neighbor like you'd want them to love you. That's the words of Christ. It fulfills the law. Now, as I preach this and as I teach this, there's probably all different things running through your head, isn't there? There is mine when I'm listening to somebody. Let me just throw a general question to bring this all together. Do you have true biblical love toward other people? Do you have true biblical love toward other people? The gospel in chapters 1 through 11 now make application. Because your sins are forgiven, because you're saved, because you have eternal life, because you have a relationship with God one-on-one, now it ought to affect how you deal and how you treat other people. And remember what we said at the beginning, love is giving, not demanding. You can't say this morning, well, this person ought to love this way, this person ought to love this way, and this person ought to do this to show that they love me. No, no, no. This has absolutely nothing to do with the other person. This has to do with me. And you have to ask yourself, do I love other people as the Bible wants me to love other people? I didn't say they deserved it. I didn't even say it would work. We love them and let God do the rest. You get home this afternoon and you have that neighbor that's maybe trimmed the tree that's on your side of the fence. So he trims it like this or throws the snow over or or does his noise or music or whatever and keeps you up till 2 in the morning. Whatever it may be. It may be that person at work that just drives you nuts. It may be something that they lie or steal from you. It may be as bad and as hideous as smacking gum in your presence. Maybe they sit there. You ever have somebody sit there and taps while they're working? Be glad you don't work close to me. I make all kinds of crazy noises. And, and I, I, have my, I have my own things. And I, I will sit there and I will tap. Okay? So what do you do? Will you cut that out? Or you say, hey, nice music. What is that? You know, they might all of a sudden realize that you can hear it. That it might bother you as you're working. I don't know. A thousand different ways. Do you have true biblical love toward other people? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. Close your eyes. I want you to think. Every message has a place in which we come to a conclusion and a time of reflection. Number one, my first question is, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If you do not know Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian, you're not sure today that if you died you'd go to heaven, then, then you can't fulfill this. You, you can do it only in a limited sense. But maybe there's someone here this morning that says, Pastor Dave, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior. You may be religious but lost. You may have a profession but not a possession. You may know it in your head but it's not in your heart. You say, Pastor Dave, I want to know more about that Christianity you talk about, that being a, being a believer in Jesus Christ. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up for a moment? No one's, go, no one's looking around, no one's going to embarrass you. Just slip your hand up if that's your deed. Because that's always a question that I always have. Number two, maybe God has sparked your heart or convicted you this morning. You say, Pastor Dave, 
I need to work on loving other people. And maybe there's a specific case or a specific instance or a situation. And, or maybe just, you know, you say, you know, I, I just battle with this. You say, pray for me. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor Dave, pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. A couple hands have been raised. Just pray for me. People are wonderful people. People are wonderful if you don't have to deal with them. But people are hard to deal with because we're all different. We're all unique. Someone else, just raise your hand up and say, Pastor, include me when you pray. As I deal with people, that I would love them as a Christian. I would love them as a believer. I would love them as God wants me to love them. Anyone else before we pray? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? See, you all know what I'm talking about, don't you? All right, thank you. It is a struggle. It, it is a chore. The more people you work with or live near, the harder it is. Anyone else before we pray, just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Include me. Help me to love others as Christ wants me to love them, the way he loved me. Father, thank you this morning that you did love us. You, you do love us continually. It never stops. Father, thank you that you have given your life for us. You've given the most that anybody could ever give. If there's one person here this morning who doesn't know Christ as Savior, may they know him before they leave this building. Father, thank you for those who raised their hands this morning and said they need help in this area. Father, I think we all do. It's a challenge. Father, help us to love one another. Just give us the grace, the courage. Help us to set our selfishness aside and our own will and say, Father, you love others through us so that we can be a testimony for Jesus Christ in this world. Father, help these ones specifically and other needs that maybe we don't know publicly. And we'll give you the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.